Many of the greatest stories in sports have come from breaking decades-long curses, but there are some professional franchises that, if you're a real diehard, will take years off your life. They keep coming up with new ways to rip your heart out, they're mired in controversy, and they trade away your favorite players. And meanwhile, hated rivals, pompous expansion teams, and those lightning-in-a-bottle lucky sons of bitches have a taste of what you've craved for decades. Are you a fan of a team like this? As someone in the same boat, I've wondered what you have. How do we keep choosing to support these teams? How come those other fans that have it oh so good not had to suffer like us? Why can't we just win it all once before we're wiped off this earth? Cheering for these teams only to experience the same result year after year has driven us to the point of literal insanity. These are the most cursed teams in sports today. Before we dive into our teams, let's first define what a sports curse is. It can take on a variety of forms, from inexplicable blunders, to career-ending injuries, to controversies and scandals, and much more. But most importantly, a true curse strings together a multitude of mishaps over the course of several decades to doom an entire fan base. We're focusing on the four major pro leagues in North America, so NBA, NFL, MLB, and NHL. For each league, I'll briefly make a case for two runners-up, and then we'll dive into the most cursed team in that league. To me, this is the hardest league to narrow down to just three finalists. Ten of the NBA's 30 teams have yet to win a finals, and five of those ten have yet to even appear in one. But let's start with a franchise that, while it has a title, has brought fans nearly 50 years of hard, hard luck, the Portland Trailblazers. This team has been doomed since Hall of Famer Bill Walton's foot injury of 1978, especially when it comes to the draft. I mean, they selected Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan. And whereas they could have had Kevin Durant, they drafted Greg Oden, whose knee problems made him one of sports' all-time draft busts. Sure, they put together several impressive runs, including appearances in the 1990 and 92 finals, but they kept running into buzzsaws including the Bad Boys Pistons, Jordan's Bulls, a Spurs dynasty in the making, a Golden State dynasty of its own, and those ever-so-lucky 2000 Lakers. Don't get me started on that fourth quarter officiating in Game 7. Our second runner-up is a team rife with boneheaded front office leadership, the Los Angeles Clippers. They've been in LA for about 40 years and have yet to advance to the finals, while the Lakers have nine titles and countless Hall of Famers in that span. Beginning as the Buffalo Braves, they traded away Hall of Famers Moses Malone, Bob McAdoo, and Adrian Dantley before or during their primes. They gambled on Bill Walton and watched him miss three full seasons with more injuries. A racist nutjob named Donald Sterling bought the team and against the will of the NBA, relocated the Clips from San Diego to La La Land. From that point up until his lifetime league ban in 2014, the franchise had the worst record in all of pro sports. So what's the most cursed NBA franchise today? Well, nothing hurts more than repeatedly being the bridesmaid and never the bride. No one knows that better than the Phoenix Suns. They're the lone NBA team to advance to three finals and never win. They had it on a platter in 2021, up two games to none on Giannis and the Bucks. With a tied series, they blew a 16-point first quarter lead in Game 5 and choked away a halftime lead in the deciding Game 6. But there's much more that goes into this one, and it's not just Chris Paul. Case in point, Exhibit A, Steve Kerr, the Suns' general manager from 04 to 2010 and architect of perennial heartbreak. This team was sizzling with a core of Amari Stoudemire, Sean Marion, and two-time MVP Steve Nash. If they could get past the Spurs in the 07 Conference semifinals, then they would have had a clear path to the championship. But merely weeks after they fell to San Antonio, a federal investigation revealed that one of the series officials, Tim Donahue, had been betting on games he worked. Donahue claimed that he was influenced by officiating supervisor Tommy Nunez's dislike for Suns owner Rob Sarver, alleging that Nunez was always pointing out in the tape sessions of things to call against Phoenix and things not to concentrate on against San Antonio. Phoenix had more agonizing series defeats under Steve Kerr's management, from Duncan's late three in Game 1 of 08 to Ron Artest's 2010 Game 5 winner. But the real death blow came in 09 during the NBA draft. The Suns believed they were about to trade away Stoudemire to the Warriors for a blockbuster package that included the seventh overall pick. But when the Warriors saw who was sliding down the draft board, Steph Curry, they backed out. Five years later, Kerr joined Steph in Oakland, and later that season, a dynasty was born. 
we can keep piling on the suns, from the Kardashians and Landry Shamet curses, and let's not forget the innumerable incidents of lewd and misogynistic conduct from now former owner Rob Sarver. Good grief, man. The Phoenix Suns are the most cursed franchise in the NBA today. It's crazy to think that 12 of the 32 teams have still yet to win one of the 57 Super Bowls. Four of those teams haven't even been to the big game. And while we could factor in the older NFL championships, really, how many of us were watching football back then? Right off the hop, there are two teams who before the Super Bowl era were highly successful, but since then, they have largely been incompetent, irrelevant, and cursed as fuck. The first I'll talk about is the Detroit Lions. They dominated the 1950s, but cut their success short by trading Hall of Fame quarterback Bobby Lane to the Steelers. Lane claimed, quote, I tried what they, I'm assuming the media or maybe fans, referred to as a hex, one that declared that they wouldn't win for 50 years. Well, for one, they've won just one playoff game since then. And second, exactly 50 years after the trade, they became the first NFL team to go winless in a 16-game season. To top it off, they've lost some of their most skilled players to early retirement, including running back Billy Sims, the best RB in my life, Barry Sanders, and the dominating Megatron, Calvin Johnson. At least the Lions have had some superstars over the past couple of decades, whereas the Cleveland Browns don't have too much to boast about since the days of Jim Brown. Cleveland has had several opportunities to get to a Super Bowl, but fumbled them away in dubious fashion. There was the Red Right 88 interception of the 1980 divisional round then John Elway's iconic 98-yard drive in 86, and the fumble against Denver the following year. The curse really showed its teeth in the 90s when Art Modell ditched Cleveland for Baltimore. The Ravens won two Super Bowls with some of the greatest defenses ever assembled. Among the AFC North division, the Steelers won two of their six titles since then, and at least the hapless Bengals have been to one in that span. As for the Browns, I mean, just look at all their starting QBs the past 20 plus years. It's filled with draft busts from Tim Couch to Brady Quinn to Johnny Manziel to Baker Mayfield. And fans are still scratching their heads over signing RG3 and Deshaun Watson. No wonder they joined the Lions with an 0-16 season of their own. So what's worse than that? How about a franchise that gets oh so very close every decade and finds the most spectacular way to pull the rug out from under itself, the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings squandered their Purple People Eaters defense as they were outscored 95-34 to across their four Super Bowl appearances. They haven't made it back to the big game since 76 despite several prime opportunities. They thought they'd get there in 89 when they pulled off the biggest trade in NFL history and what became one of the biggest curses in sports, the Herschel Walker deal. The Cowboys ultimately used the acquired draft picks to select Emmitt Smith and Darren Woodson. Dallas won three Super Bowls in the 90s, whereas the Vikings blew maybe their best opportunity to win one yet. You see, sliding all the way down to 21st in the 98 draft was Randy Moss. With the Super Freak, the Vikings produced the NFL's highest scoring offense up until that point. But with a chance at a Super Bowl riding on the leg of Gary Anderson, well, as Urinating Tree once said, Vikings gonna Vikings. 39 yards away, and it's not good. That 38-yarder was the lone field goal that Anderson missed all year. Then came a 41-0 shellacking in the 2000 Conference Championship against the Giants, the tragic loss of tackle Corey Stringer the next year, the Love Boat scandal of 05, and then the most unlikely of alliances. In 09, Minnesota brought aboard their franchise's longtime nemesis, Brett Favre. He led the team back to the conference title against the Saints, but one, he took a pummeling, and two, he saved maybe his most infamous playoff interception for what could have been the game-winning drive. It was later discovered that the Saints were placing bounties on Favre and other league players in the infamous Bounty Gate scandal. The hits kept on coming the next decade, from drafting Christian Ponder, to the Metrodome collapsing, to Adrian Peterson winning Father of the Year, to Blair Walsh's 27-yard shank at the bank that would have sent the Vikings to the divisional round. It seemed that maybe all would be forgiven two years later, when Minnesota put together maybe its best season since 98, clinching a conference championship berth with a miracle that I had the fortune of seeing in person. The Vikings were one win away from hosting a Super Bowl in their own stadium. All they had to do was shut down Nick Foles and the Eagles on the road. They marched downfield on their first possession to take a 7-0 lead. But then, the horrors of conference championships past were unleashed on the team of destiny. Those same Eagles won Super Bowl 52 at U.S. Bank Stadium. How does a franchise boasting a legendary defense, Fran Tarkenton, Chris Carter, Randy Moss, 
John Randall, Adrian Peterson, and now Justin Jefferson failed to win one Super Bowl and for nearly 50 years now even get to one. And meanwhile, their next door neighbor, the Packers, have four Lombardi trophies to caress. No coin flip needed here, folks. The Minnesota Vikings are the most cursed NFL franchise today. Some of baseball's biggest curses have been lifted over the past 20 years or so, but today there are still six franchises looking to break their World Series drought. For one, the San Diego Padres have to be on this list, not just because the franchise is cursed, but San Diego is cursed. It's mind-boggling that a team featuring the greatest pure hitter of that era, Tony Gwynn, and maybe the greatest closer in National League history, Trevor Hoffman, never won a ring. Playoff appearances have been a rarity, as the team played in just one NLCS their first 29 years. They won four division championships with Bruce Bochy at the helm, but unfortunately, Jake Peavy couldn't pitch every game for them. Flash forward after 13 more lackluster campaigns. In 2010, the Padres were dominating the NL West with a six and a half game lead, but they went a horrific 14 and 23 down the stretch, and in their last game were shut out by the division winner, the Giants, and their manager, none other than Bruce Bochy. Since then, three World Series for the Giants, one World Series and perennial dominance for their biggest rival, the Dodgers. As much of a failure as the A's and Angels have been more recently, the Padres really are California's red-headed stepchild. I guess that would make the Texas Rangers the black sheep of Greater Dallas. This curse all started in Washington, D.C., when owner Bob Short decided to move the team to Texas, much to the ire of fans. The new crop of supporters would have to wait 23 years for a playoff berth, and to their misfortune, the Rangers kept running into the Dynasty Yankees. They finally slayed the Dragon in 2010, defeating New York in the ALCS for their first ever World Series appearance, but they were no match against the same flamethrowing giants from earlier. To their credit, they returned to the Fall Classic next year. In Game 6, leading 7-5 in the bottom of the ninth with two outs, they were one strike away from tasting glory, until David Freeze, within mere inches, was able to tie things up. The next inning, the Cardinals were down to their final strike again, until Lance Berkman came through with maybe the biggest hit of his lengthy career. And then leading off the home half of the 11th, the ninth inning hero Freeze sent the series to Game 7. The cards prevailed for the final World Series in Tony La Russa's Hall of Fame career. It might seem impossible to find another MLB franchise with even more heartbreak, but this last club embodies the word itself, the Cleveland Indians, or today's Cleveland Guardians. It's been over 75 years since their last World Series, and you won't believe what they've endured since then. The curse may have originated in 1958, when GM Frank Lane fired new manager Bobby Bregan. Legend has it that upon his exit, Bregan walked out to second base at Cleveland Municipal Stadium and placed a curse on the tribe, although he denied it. Not even two years later, Lane traded away Rocky Colavito to the Tigers, after he had led the AL with 42 home runs. The Indians spiraled into both irrelevance and infamy, failing to finish within 11 games of first place for a 33-year stretch. They traded away Tommy John in 65, and all he did was go on to win 286 more games. Nine years later, with serious attendance problems, they hosted 10 Cent Beer Night and witnessed hundreds of fans rioting on the field mid-game. Then in 87, they made their own mark on the Sports Illustrated cover curse by losing 101 games. And lastly in 93, they tragically lost Steve Olin, Tim Cruz, and nearly Bob Ojeda in a boating accident. The tribe got back in business from there on. They were on pace for maybe their best season in 40 years, but then the 94 strike happened. One year later, they rebounded with their first World Series appearance in 51 years, taking on the Atlanta Braves, but they were shut out in Game 6 to preserve the curse. Just like the Rangers, they quickly got a shot at redemption, facing the Marlins in the 97 series, and with two outs left in Game 7, were on the doorstep of greatness. Craig Council's sack fly extended the game to extra innings, and just like with the Rangers 13 years later, the Tribe fell victim to one Edgar Renteria. A liner off Nagy's guard into center field. The Florida Marlins have won the World Series. Ten years later, the Indians had another deep run in them, taking a 3-1 series lead against Terry Francona's Red Sox in the ALCS. But Boston outscored Cleveland in the next three games, 30-5. In 2013, Cleveland hired Francona to be their next skipper. In his fourth season, his club steamrolled the Red Sox in the ALDS and shut down a potent Blue Jays offense. All that was left was a curse versus curse World Series, the 68-year curse of the Indians versus the 108-year curse of the Chicago Cubs. Cleveland's hurlers continued their postseason dominance, holding the Cubbies to just seven runs in the first four games. The Indians were one win away from ending decades upon decades of misery. 
Trevor Bauer didn't get enough run support in Game 5, and Josh Tomlin was rattled early in Game 6 to force the series deciding Game 7 at the Jake. Trailing 6-3 in the top of the 8th, the Tribe rallied with the help of Rajay Davis's two-run blast off a Roldis Chapman. Following a scoreless ninth, the game would need a brief rain delay to be decided. Following two Cubs runs in the top of the 10th, the Indians fell just a little short of the ultimate redemption, instead blowing a 3-1 series lead against what was the most cursed team in North America. This degree of pain is par for the course with Cleveland sports, but it stands out among 29 other MLB clubs. The once Indians, now Cleveland Guardians, are the most cursed franchise in the majors today. Now to my sport, hockey, and don't forget that we have a separate YouTube channel that's all about that. 11 of the NHL's 32 teams have yet to win the Stanley Cup, and 5 of them have yet to advance to the final. For our two runners-up, we look back to when they both entered the NHL in 1970, the Vancouver Canucks and the Buffalo Sabres. Right out the gate, they shared a common thread stemming from the 1970 draft lottery, when the Canucks believed that they had won the first overall pick. Instead, it went to the Sabres, and they used it on Hall of Famer Gilbert Perrault. To their credit, the Canucks went on a couple of unprecedented runs, including the 1982 final, and they nearly, nearly pulled off a huge upset in 89 against the would-be champion Calgary Flames. Five years later, they were back in the final, forcing Game 7 versus Marc Messier's New York Rangers. If only Nathan Lafayette's game-tying bid didn't hit the post. The Canucks tried to get over the hump three years later by signing Messier and trading away Captain Canuck, Trevor Linden but they found themselves either blowing series leads or participating in some of the worst abuse the game has ever seen. Vancouver re-emerged in the early 2010s with Hall of Famers Henrik and Daniel Sedin. In 2011, they stormed their way into the final against the Boston Bruins, but after blowing a 2-0 series lead, including an embarrassing 4-0 loss in Game 7, the so-called fans burned the city to the ground. Since then, they've won just two playoff series. But you know who hasn't won a single series in that time because they haven't even been to the playoffs since then? The Buffalo Sabres. Buffalo actually succeeded early on, reaching the final in just their fifth year. But their championship run may have been thwarted when Jim Lorenz bludgeoned a bat that was flying around Memorial Auditorium in the infamous fog game. The Flyers won the series in six. Following years of futility, the Sabres were reborn with the likes of Pat LaFontaine, Alexander McGilney, and perhaps the most talented goaltender of all time, Dominic Hoshik. In 99, they made it back to the final, squaring off against the Dallas Stars. Hashik's former teammate, Ed Belfour, surrendered just nine goals over six games. And in that series deciding game six, Brett Hull would live on in Sabres infamy with this triple overtime tally. Coach Lindy Ruff and the Buffalo faithful thought Hull had illegally scored as his skate was in the crease while the puck wasn't. But since Hull had possession of the puck throughout the play, the call on the ice was correct. Flash forward to 2011 when Terry Pagula bought the Sabres and pledged, starting today, the Buffalo Sabres' reason for existence will be to win a Stanley Cup. What followed was a seemingly never-ending playoff drought, filled with catastrophically abysmal contracts. More pain arrived when they lost the 2015 draft lottery for a chance to recruit Connor McDavid. As for their consolation prize, Jack Eichel, well, the Sabres refused to permit an artificial disc replacement procedure and sent him packing to the Vegas Golden Knights, where in his first full season and first playoffs appearance, he was among the brightest of stars. But there's one more NHL franchise whose curse rears its ugly head just about every year these days, and even though they have the second most championships, they have largely been irrelevant since the league expanded from a whopping six teams. Of course, I'm talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now, while there was the curse of Bill Barocco back in 51, that was lifted just 11 years later, so we're going to skip ahead to 1967. The Leafs had just won their 13th Stanley Cup in the final year of the original Six era. That offseason, defenseman Larry Hillman claimed to have put a curse on the franchise after being fined $2,400 for a contract holdout. But the true curse doesn't originate in hockey, but rather baseball. Years before Toronto's NHL club took on the Maple Leafs moniker, there was a historic Toronto Maple Leafs baseball team. Not only did they carry the Maple Leafs name, but they also sported the same blue and white colors. The NHL Maple Leafs were planning to buy the baseball team, but because Chairman Harold Ballard didn't want to make repairs to the stadium, the NHL club backed out. The baseball team relocated to Kentucky under new ownership, completing their sale that same year in October of 67. Five years later, Ballard became Toronto's notorious principal owner. That same year, he was convicted on 47 of 49 tax evasion and fraud charges, including embezzling $82,000 from arena revenues to remodel his home. He showed little loyalty to his best players, especially the legendary Dave Keon, 
using the media to imply that Keon would never get a loony more from him. And even after Keon's contract expired, Ballard blocked other teams from signing him. Or how about when he wanted to trade Hall of Famer and Leafs all-time leading scorer Daryl Sittler, who had a no-trade clause in his contract. Instead, Ballard traded Sittler's friend, Hall of Famer Lanny McDonald, who won a cup in the final year of his career. We also can't forget when Ballard fired longtime timekeeper Ace Bailey, who served the role for 46 years after his NHL career was cut short by a brutal shot from Bruins defenseman Eddie Shore that put him in a coma. There are countless accounts of Harold Ballard, and even though he's long passed away, his musk still stinks up Maple Leaf Gardens, as his son, who like his siblings, was cut out of his father's inheritance, once recounted, my dad once told me that he would run the club from his grave, and that's what he's doing. The curse persisted even without Ballard's corporeal form. A year after his passing, there was the missed high stick on Wayne Gretzky in overtime of Game 6 in the 93 Conference Final. Whereas he should have been in the penalty box, Gretzky forced a Game 7 a minute later with this momentum-crushing goal. A decade later would mark the start of a lengthy 19-year drought without winning a playoff series. Oh boy, where to begin with this one? In 2013, in Game 7 against the Bruins, they let a 4-1 third period lead vanish and fell in overtime. In 2018, Nazem Kadri took an egregious charging penalty that warranted a three-game suspension. The Leafs once again fell in seven games to the Bruins. 2019 was deja vu. Kadri goes after Jake DeBrusque in Game 2 and gets suspended, but this time for the rest of the series. The Leafs fell to, you guessed it, the Bruins in seven games. The next year in the regular season, 42-year-old emergency backup goaltender David Ayers saved 8 of 10 shots for the Carolina Hurricanes at Scotiabank Arena. Where'd this guy come from? Turns out he was none other than the Zamboni driver of the Maple Leafs minor league affiliate, the Toronto Marlies. How does it get any worse? Maybe we can point to the playoffs the next year when Toronto blew a 3-1 series lead against an inferior Canadiens roster. And then last year, they lost their 10th consecutive opportunity to win a playoff series, falling at home against the Tampa Bay Lightning in seven games. Toronto finally got over the hump this year against Tampa, but they unceremoniously bowed out to the Florida Panthers in the next round. Those 13 cups sure don't mean anything to most fans these days, as most of them have yet to even see their team get close to another one. The Toronto Maple Leafs are the most cursed franchise in the NHL today. So who do you think are the most cursed teams in sports? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Of course, there were only so many teams that I could include on this list. I did snub quite a few out there, especially for basketball. I really wanted to put in there the Sacramento Kings and the Charlotte Hornets. And I know I snubbed like the Seattle Mariners for baseball and some teams in hockey like my San Jose Sharks, but I had a blast producing this video and hopefully I can deliver more content for you like this in the near future. Before you go, just a couple things. First of all, I do appreciate if you can support my work, become a member, there are all sorts of benefits for that. Just tap the join button down below for more info. You can also leave a super thanks. That's always nice too. And lastly, if you're a fan of hockey, I invite you to check out two of my channels. I have Twisted Rister Hockey, and I also have a new channel called Sudden Death Hockey, shorter commentary style videos there. So hopefully I have a chance to interact with you about that sport and other sports here on SDS. I appreciate you so much for tuning in. I'm Nick, and I'll see you next time right here on Sudden Death Sports.